Welcome everyone to What is Black, a parenting podcast that addresses issues important to raising healthy and thriving Black children and teens. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Duje. On today's episode, we keep the conversation going about reimagining systems and institutions to better serve families raising Black children and teens, with a conversation about the topic of discussing race beyond the binary of Black or white. We want to focus today on the discussion of the impact of racism on AAPI communities. Um, This conversation comes about in the midst of the news about the rise of AAPI violence, anti-AAPI violence. Data um, from the March 2020 Stop AAPI Hate National Report reported nearly 3,800 reports of anti-Asian hate incidents. Some of the national trends they highlighted were that women were two, almost two times more likely than men to report hate incidents. Youth ages 0 to 17 accounted for about 13% of the reports, and seniors over 60 years old accounted for 6%. And the largest minority groups reporting hate incidents um, were Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, and Filipino um, ethnic groups. We know that the long history of white supremacy has created this context that centers this conversation of racism um, and its impact, mostly in the binary white and black and I believe has fostered the erasure of the impact on other racial groups. White supremacy and systemic racism's roots run deep in our, within our country. My belief is that in order to improve the health and well-being of Black children and their families, as well as all children, we must collectively work collectively to assure that all Black and Brown children and their families are seen, heard, and that we join in, in solidarity to dismantle white supremacy and systemic racism. Only then will we truly achieve racial and social justice. And joining me today to to discuss this issue are Dr. Kamara Gustafson. She's on faculty at the University of Minnesota um, in the pediatric department as an assistant professor. And Dr. Jonathan Tolentino, program director of UMJMH MedPeds program and associate professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Miami. And during my conversation, I will be I'll be referring to them using their first names. So I'd like to welcome Kamara and JT to the show today. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Oh, again, thank you for, for joining me today. And it's, it is a pleasure um, to have you on the show. Um, so I have my list of questions <laughs> for, um, for today's um, discussion. Um, so, you know, during the introduction, I talked about how the main focus of today's conversation um, is to is to talk about racism against the AAPI communities, but ultimately, right? We it's a discussion about the roots of racism, which is white supremacy. And Kamara, I mean, prior to the prior to the interview, you shared, um, you know, you work and live in Minneapolis or in the Minneapolis area, and as we know right now, the world's eyes are focused on um, Minneapolis, given um, George George Floyd's murder last year. In 2020, the current trial of um, David Chauvin and the recent murder of um, Dante Wright. So I definitely wanted to acknowledge um, acknowledge those events and wanted to get your thoughts um, about, um, as well as yours, um, JT, on these recent events. And and also, right, really how this all interplays, right? We're, we're really talking about white supremacy and how um, this evil, right, um, this legacy of our country has really created um, the, this this issue that we're trying to address, right? Systemic racism and really fighting for for racial and social justice for all for Black and Brown people. Yeah, I think that um, at least you know being here in Minneapolis, um, and um, for better for worse, having kind of firsthand um, view into what's going on. You know, it's interesting to me to see just how each event has been reacted to um, in varying degrees, you know, because they actually going even, you know, back before, you know, George Floyd's murder, you know, Philando Castillo was, was also murdered. Um, And I saw um, a post yesterday that someone had mapped out, you know, where Philando was murdered, um, which we drive by every day to get to my son's swimming lesson. And then where George Floyd was murdered, which um, was in the neighborhood I used to live in. And then um, where Dante Wright was murdered, which is up by um, a pediatric hospice home that I uh, am medical director at. And, you know, you you draw kind of this triangle um, and 
it's they're not very far from each other. And so it's just really interesting to me to see the response. You know, we had definite uh, understandable outrage after Philando, but then I think it kind of dissipated, um, unfortunately. And and then, you know, again, understandable outrage after George Floyd's murder. Um, and it's taken a year for us to even get to the trial. You know, we're in the midst of the trial. And then, you know, as everyone kind of pointed out, and it's very palpable here that, you know, part of, I think, what's interesting about the coverage of Dante Wright is that everyone was actually already here. So all of these, you know, the mayor of Brooklyn Center, for better or for worse, he's, you know, relatively inexperienced is now having to to field questions from CNN and MSNBC. And, and it's, I think, more because they all were about three, you know, not three blocks, but less than three miles away covering the trial. They're like, oh, let's just pivot over here to this other neighborhood. Um, and so bringing, I think, a media spotlight that may or may not have been um, kind of available to, to Dante Wright and his family had it not been, you know, just the kind of uh, circumstances that that coalesced to bring us to where we are today. And so, um, but I think you're right, Jackie, I mean, it all goes back to, you know, what is the root cause or kind of root um, source? And I think it just goes back to white supremacy as, as kind of the, the root source. Um, and so similarly, you know, definitely something that is being experienced in the AAPI community as well. Yeah, because, you know, um, after seeing what happened to Dante Wright, after what I'm seeing what even um, with that one army medic over in Virginia being pulled over by um, by the by the police. And um, and on top of that, you're still seeing many stories coming through about Asian-American um, and Asian um, um, elder, elderly being harassed or physically beaten on the on the streets of American cities. It's this constant reminder, and I think that was that's what's really fascinating um, and really sad, and a true um, uh, commentary on where we are um, when it comes to white supremacy is that it's so deep seated that um, every new thing just reiterates that this is something that is such a major part of how our system runs and how we are taught and how we've been acculturated here in the United States. And, um, you know, you, often you hear about people on social media or what have you, whether it's your close associates or friends talking about, well, um, this was a bad apple or this was something that was a one-off, but it's the patterns. And, you know, in medicine, we talk about patterns all the time. As pediatricians, this is what we talk about, right? When a child isn't growing appropriately or um, the weight's down just a little bit uh, at one well-child visit, we say, come back the next time and we'll see if this is an ongoing pattern. But from um, for us as pediatricians, we see this. We see this as a pattern that is consistent and there's something systemic, there's something structurally that is be, that is born into the system that we've grown in, that, that we live in and that we've grown up and that that we are um, that we're living that we have to really think about how do we dismantle this um, and I think um, many many members of the API community um, um, many uh, of many of those in the Latinx and the black communities we 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 feel the fatigue because we know that the system while um, while we're shocked every single time it happens we know that the system is still there and it's a very slow system, a very large system to dismantle in a very slow process. And we're asking for it to actually, for that process, for that structures to be dismantled faster. But there's so many forces that seem to remind us that it's, it's still there and it's still very strong. And, um, and while we have many people fighting for it, um, it, 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 it almost, it's just demoralizing um, for many of us. Yeah, I can I can relate to that because I think even preparing for the episode, right, and thinking about acknowledging um, these, you know, Dante Wright's uh, murder, like it brought up feelings, right? And and I was telling my husband earlier, it's like it's like it's not numbness, right? Because I'm not numb to it anymore. But as I told my husband, I, I looked at I looked at Dante Wright and I said, you know what? Damn, like that could be my son, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it harkens back to um, a little bit to what um, former President Obama had said regarding Trayvon Wright, you know, mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin, I'm sorry, Trayvon Martin, that that could have, you know, had he had a son, that could have that could have been his son, right? And so 
And so, I, and I also think about the fact that Dante was 20, right? Yeah. So that's our, that's our wheelhouse, right? You know, you talk about, um, JT, you talked about our role as pediatricians and looking at trends. And that really, really caught my eye that, you know, he's an, he's an adolescent. Yeah. Yeah. I also thought what was interesting about Dante was that, um, you know, immediately after there was pictures um, that were circulating of his mother, um, she had arrived on scene um, and she's white. And so I thought it was just interesting. Obviously, you know, I don't know the right family um, personally, but just some of the things that I started to think about that I think are also maybe related to some of the discussions we've been having within the AAPI community is, you know, that his proximity to whiteness still was not enough to keep him safe. And I wonder, you know, we had talked previously, Jackie, about, you know, that within the Black community, it's kind of known that you have to have the talk with your child um, at some point of how do you behave with the police? How do you behave when you're around kind of um, people of authority that, you know, may not be there to protect you in the way that they protect other um you know, young people in the community. Um, and it, again, I don't know for the right family at all, but I just, I wondered, you know, did she know this um, or did she, did she have the talk with him in that same way? And not necessarily because to fault her, but just that with her not being a person of color um, that, you know, wondering if, you know, that his proximity to whiteness would have shielded him in a way um, that was maybe different from other people of color. And then also it got me thinking was that, you know, the news reports were saying that she was, he was driving her car. And so it's like, again, you know, would she be stopped for an air freshener if, if she was the one driving the car? Probably not, you know? So it just, it was, I think just kind of sparked a lot of thoughts that I'd had about, um, you know, how do we, how do we parent mm -hmm. in, in this, you know, in this kind of environment and, um, <clears throat> and how do you, like when your kids ask questions about, you know, like I, we were, I was talking to my eight year old today about it and because everything's getting boarded up again and it's just a little bit over the top, but, um, you know, and he's asking me like, why? And, and I said, well, it doesn't always make sense, you know? grown-ups don't always make sense we act like we <laughs> that we know a lot of things but but they said we don't and um and sometimes some of the things that we do they're not right um and so you know but part of our job as parents is to try to I think hopefully help the next generation to know you know in a better way like kind of learn from our mistakes of like what's right and what's wrong and you know they don't always fall along the same <clears throat> kind of black and white of like what's you know legal or lawful versus you know kind of illegal or unlawful so yeah I think just kind of pertinent a lot to when we think about some of you know what we had talked about um previously within the API community of that that potentially the kind of the talk, if it's had in the API community is a little bit different or has historically been different about, you know, keep your head down and try to kind of just blend in with your surroundings and try not to, you know, draw attention to yourself. And if you do draw attention to yourself, it's through your achievement or through your kind of merit accomplishments. Um, and that by, you know, kind of, rising up to meet that model minority myth, then, you know, somehow that will be kind of our entrance into um, greater acceptance, which I think we're seeing now in the rising generations that they're, you know, pushing back and saying, well, even if I have all of the diplomas and all of the accolades and all the, you know, I'm still, if I get pulled over, I'm still going to be viewed as the other. Um, depending on who's kind of stopping me or confronting me. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, one of the things that I, that, that comes to mind when you're talking about safety and even to some, to proximity um, is this entire sense of, of how much, how much are we driven by fear 
And, you know, as parents, um, um, we want safety for our children because, uh, you know, we fear what could potentially happen. Right. And um, I think a lot of our parents and a lot of a lot of um, uh, parents who are who now see this violence, they start, and even in the past, they start thinking about how can we assimilate as much as we can. And assimilation is, um, to some extent, another way of trying to get as close to um, to the white proximity um, f- um, for um, for a lot of us. And I think, you know, um, I think one of the things that I, we were talking about before is um, kind of like the name choices, right? Um, uh, many many of my Asian um, friends and family, we have our Asian name and we have our American name. And, um, and, uh, that's, and we use wherever we go, our Asian name, our, our American names, right? You know, um, you, um, you introduced me as, as JT earlier today, but I have a Chinese name, um, I mean, Hui, the, which I never use because it's not seen as, as something that would necessarily be used elsewhere. Right. And this, that assimilation, I think, um, uh, again, kind of blends us in and kind of provides that that sense of safety within our society um and so that we're not singled out i mean if you know if, if you look at my name jonathan tolentino you would have no idea that i um i am in um an asian american philo- uh, gay filipino physician um working in miami i you know it sounds very english Anglicized um from that standpoint and i think that's 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 something that that I think our parents and many, many, uh, many parents even now think about is how can we keep our children as safe as possible? Um, but at the same time, it still keeps within this, this structure of, of white supremacy to assure that that we're not, you know, you're not creating too many waves and that you're 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 using you're still working within this system of merit which actually ends up oppressing as opposed to elevating, in many cases, many many members of the API community. So JT and Kamar, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, you know, expand upon the idea of the talk, right? So again, so for, you know, I've had the, I've had the talk with my sons, right? But again, it's in the context of they're Black boys and I don't want them to get killed by the police. And so, but again, that's, that's, that's the way we're set up, right? I've known for a long time, right? White versus black. And I know even from my experience that the history lessons of oppression and um, triumph of other groups haven't, haven't necessarily been explored with, with our kids. All right. So having that talk, right. I'll have the talk with my kids, but I don't necessarily have the talk in the, in the, with the mindset that, you know, what other, other communities have the talk, right? And if they do have the talk, what does that sound like, right? And so again, putting that in the, in the mind frame of the binary, right? So it's white versus black. So it, it creates this, this spectrum, right? This continuum of who's in the hierarchy of who needs to be protected, who is not as safe, who, 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 like in this merit system. So I wanted to get your, as long-winded way of asking, you can talk a little bit more about about that and and your thoughts now um if you have kids right how if you're approaching that talk that you may have had you know had as a child differently or even talking talking to to patients about that talk well i think there's in my mind um kind of two talks um in a way i think there's like the the talk that i um have come to learn about you know from my my friends who are in the black community about exactly what you said, Jackie, that at some point you go from being seen as cute um, to being seen as a threat. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of um, friends saying that we need to have a talk with our kids about um, before you are seen as a threat, you know, how do you kind of act um, in a way to minimize that and so you know that um if you're stopped you know that having to be overly deferential um and so as not to put yourself in a situation where any kind of behavior or or act could be seen as aggressive or um disrespectful and i think that um then the secondary kind of talk that i really try to champion both for for our family, but then any of my friends and colleagues that will um, listen to me ramble is 
just the talk of um because i think i think outside of the black community my sense is that the the problem kind of the flip problem is that no one else is really having any talk about this you know talking about race or racism with their kids because it's always thought of as well kids are so young and they're innocent and we don't want to kind of do anything to um infringe upon that innocence um and my pushback on that is like if you ask um older people so adolescents or adults that are of color or that are um and minoritized in some way, when was the first time that they had an experience where they were othered? It always, always happens when they're in, you know, preschool or grade school, um, like early grade school, like kindergarten. And so in the absence of having the talk with all of our kids, our kids are still, com- you know, they're, they're still cohorting and kind of, um, they're very concrete, you know, they're putting people into different boxes and, um, in different ways they're genderizing or kind of grouping based on skin color or, you know, other assumptions. And if we don't kind of dispel that, then that just gets perpetuated in their mind um, and goes on to be, um, you know, unfortunately uh, kind of becomes more flagrant racism. And so when you see these people that are like, you know, we didn't raise our kids to be this way. You know, if, if someone actually does something that's overtly racist, you know, usually the immediate family is like, oh, we didn't raise them to be this way. Or the community is like, you know, I never knew that these are things that he thought about or she thought about. And it's like, yes, but did you proactively push back on some of these things? Or did you kind of laugh with, you know, and so similarly, you know, we talk about, um, you know, in our house, because I'm, the only I'm um, I have three boys and so I do a lot of talking about like here are things that girls can do you know and pushing back on because I'm like you know I gotta hold my ground with with my family but um with the boys but then you know similarly allowing them to say don't feel like you have to be pigeonholed into things that boys do you know you can do like whatever uh, and it doesn't have to be a boy girl thing um so I think that's where I feel like, um, in my experience, that and it hasn't been well modeled. And so I think that that's where sometimes when when something when someone's not comfortable with something, then it they tend to avoid it because they're just mm-hmm. not, they're like, oh, I don't want to say something wrong or do something wrong. And I just I kind of try to tell people, you know, it's like with everything, you just got to practice like riding a bike or, you know, you know, uh, like I was telling a friend, you know, you, your kid usually isn't potty trained in a day. You got to keep practicing at it. And similarly, like they don't become a racist in a day or anti-racist in a day. It's like something you got to just have one conversation and then build on that and then build on that. Um, and the more you talk about it, the more comfortable you become in talking about it. And then they feel that comfort because kids are so intuitive. Um, But then I feel like it just gives them the tools as they get older to be comfortable so that we're not having to have these kind of hushed, you know, behind closed doors kind of discussions. Yeah, because the other thing I would also add is that many of many of our many of our kids, our children, especially definitely in high school, but even school age kids, they're seeing it on social media. They're seeing it on TV. Um, You know, unless unless you are in a world where the TV is off and there's no radio, there's no there's no phones in any of the school rooms, which now uh, we know now is really not not the case for them for the majority of the kids. They they're exposed to it. They see it. And more importantly, um, the one thing is that they don't necessarily understand it. And so, um, you know, going back to Kamara's point, we have to talk about it with our kids. We have to acknowledge it. And I think one of the important things to, um, for parents, whenever, whenever I think about um, Asian parents, and, you know, I see this, I don't have any kids of my own, but I see this with um, many of my, uh, my, uh, my family's um, children, cousins, what have you, is that if you don't talk about it, then it makes it harder for them to be able to manage it. And um, and I think that's one of the hard parts about about a lot of the racism that's out there that our children are going to be experiencing or have experienced. Um, uh, and I think one um, 
for parents to be honest with their children, but, you know, age appropriate, but still honest about, about what's going on, um, honest about their own feelings. And honest and also acknowledging their children's feelings, I think, is such an important part when, when you start initiating that talk. Um, I think what's I think what's hard is that this talk has not been modeled to us as parents. Our parents didn't really didn't um, took a very different mindset when it came to dealing with these issues. And I remember when I was a kid, um, you know, I went to a high school where I, it was me and one other one other kid in my fourth grade class who were of, of any type of Asian descent. So I was often called his name or vice versa. And I was constantly confused, even though I'm Filipino and, and the, um, the other kid was, um, was, uh, uh, Japanese, I believe. Um, but I think what we, um, and then the, the hard part was that I didn't know, I eventually figured out how to how to manage it but it takes that's it's really really tough and a lot a lot of times um uh parents initially struggle with that conversation but you know i'm um, having that conversation about being able to identify it let them again having the kids understand what what they're really experiencing that it's not a joke you know when, when they come up with all these terrible asian names um that those are not jokes and those, those aren't cute and laughing along with it doesn't necessarily make it better or make it or 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 make it things easier for you and then understanding that um that uh that you that um that these are things that need to be at least identified and called out can really help children a identify what's what's not appropriate for themselves but also help them um really begin to understand and have that language and have those have those words understand what's going on one of um one example that actually one of my good friends from back in the midwest um she adopted a, a chinese adoptee um and she's white and her child is now a 14, 14 years old and um, starting high school next year. Um, and she did a really great job of modeling that um, for her 14 year old child. Now, uh, I'm, I actually recently had lunch with her and she, um, this, this child was so good about calling things out and so good about being able to, uh, being able to, to tell um, other kids that's not right. Or those, those things, um, those, those things don't represent who I am. Um, and part of me was like, man, I, I wish, I wish I had that when I was a kid, I didn't have that language. So, you know, when kids came up to me and said, do a karate kick, I just did it. Cause you know, I was just trying to fit in with everybody else. Mm -hmm. I, you know, part of me wishes that I had that language and I had that ability. And I think, um, for, um, for my, for my patient's parents, the, that's one of the most important messages I think that any of us can give where, um, regards to, um, racism and having that talk. But, um, I, I completely get it. This is a tough talk. Many, many parents don't want to have it and many parents are, are afraid to have it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, um, and I actually, uh, got this advice from, um, a friend who's a psychologist is she said that, um, and nowadays maybe we don't have as much opportunity because of the pandemic, but she said a great place to have some of these kind of talks that are a little bit more maybe, um, uncomfortable is in the car. Um, because you don't have to look at each other and it's kind of a finite amount of time. So, you know, you're, if you're like, you know, okay, I'm going to be in the car or we're running errands or something, and we're going to, this is going to take maybe 15 minutes. This is like a good time to start kind of talking about it. Um, because, you know, we're not looking at each other and we can kind of pretend like we're being distracted by other things with driving and stuff, but they're also kind of a captive audience and they're not able to get distracted by, um, you know, telephone or social media or, or different things. And so I've actually you know, implemented this a couple of times. And then um, it's like, you know, kind of careful what you wish for, because now my kids um, ask me in the car all the time. They ask all kinds of questions and I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> <laughs> OK, I guess we're talking about this in the car now. Great. <laughs> like I was I'm like waiting for my coffee to kick in. But I, I do think that it is kind of a nice opportunity sometimes to do that and not have it feel maybe as awkward as you're kind of worried that it might be. So, so I put, so please forgive me for not asking this when we started out, how are you all, how are you all doing, right? Not only with AAPI, you know, racism, anti-AAPI racism, but just like, I mean, it's just, a, it's just, it's just heavy, right? This, mm -hmm. 
the things that we're dealing with, right? And on top of, you know, whatever things, whatever, whatever life is throwing at us, right? It's wearying. For me, it's wearying, right? Mm-hmm. Too. But it's important work that we have to do. And in many instances, this work of addressing anti-racism sometimes falls on the backs of black or brown people, right? Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted to know how are you all doing? Um and and how do you how do you keep yourself like what's your self care or how do you how do you keep yourself motivated and 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 ready to to do the work that you have to do and and be be there for your your significant others and for all that you have to do. You know, I, I will say that it's um it's been tough. Um I think it's been very tiring. Um you know, as a as a physician, I'm I'm an internist and a pediatrician, so I've worked on the COVID units both on on the adult side and the pediatric end. And you know, I think even from the very beginning, um, back in the when the inklings kept, um, first started coming through, and in January and February, and then really hit us pretty hard in March and April. Um, I think it's been I, I think it's been um, so difficult because uh, as a Asian American born here in the United States, um, it's very, it was very tough to hear people talk about this, about this China, the Chinese virus and, and almost laying blame uh, on us, which I think is, is tough because, um, you know, many a times I would, you know, you get on an elevator and people will walk off and, and it's and it's so strange, right? You, you, you're you're almost automatically isolated, um, just because you know, obviously by the way you look. Um, but then you're not, not only are you isolated because of the way you look, but then the un, you're suddenly contagious. And I think that's probably what's even more isolating, that um, that your mere presence is sickening. And I think um, it's exhausting to go through that. It's gotten. It, you, you have your ups and your downs. Some days are better. Some days are worse. Um, and now that things have gotten a little, have gotten better, there's been a few changes politically here in the United States have, that, that have kind of helped stem that tide. But every so often, you know, I, you know, I'm a big runner and, you'd be, and I'll run through, um, through the streets and you'll still hear things, um, you know, uh, that, that are just, just sickening. And, and it just, it's that constant reminder. And it's kind of like the allostatic load that we talk a lot about and, um, and work with, um, uh, with social determinants of health where you just, it's, it's just, it's just a lot. Right. Um, and I think when it comes down to, uh, how do you, how do you go, how do you manage that on top of the pandemic, on, on top of social distancing, I'm a residency program director. So on top of supporting your residents going through all of this, um, you know, through, you know, lots of conversation and tears and what have you. Um, I think one of the things that I think was bit, I think for a lot of us is still having that social support that we always have relied upon, you know, friends and family and, you know, and especially for those friends of ours that, um, and my family that, that can also, that, that, you know, who are Asian and who have also under, understand that and being able to, um, share our stories with each other. I, um, I think has been um, so important and then having allies who understand and who are um, and I think that's been such an important part of of how I've been able to get through a lot of this and get through um, get through this um, because it's otherwise it's it's tough and I know we, we talk about in pediatrics right now how there's this huge mental health crisis that, are, that many of our especially our adolescents are going through right now but I, I think um, for many of our, our our black and brown and, and Asian um, pediatricians out there, th- um, we're going through a lot of the same stressors. And I think um, self-care is so important. Um, but the hard part about self-care is that um, finding time for self-care is always more difficult. <laughs> and it's it's like one of those theoretical things, kind of like a work-life balance <laughs> um, that can be uh, tough to actually accomplish. Um, but I think... Uh, We've done, I think we're getting a better idea of what that really means for a lot of us and that um, uh, really understanding where that separation occurs and and how to re-energize ourselves um, has gone beyond, you know, just taking the two-week vacation, but it's almost those micro-regenerations that you need just to, to get through the day, day in and day out. Yeah, and I think, you know, to echo what JT was saying, I mean, I feel like there's so many layers of, you know, that there's um like 
COVID and then kind of the racism related to COVID within the API community and then just racism inherent in, you know, structural racism of, of our country. Um, and then kind of the attack on science that we've endured for this last year. And um, so there's all these ways that I, actually I, this is unrelated a little bit to today's topic, but I volunteered last weekend um, to administer COVID vaccines. And it struck me because I, this um, really delightful, like 90 year old, she brought a whole box of donuts and it had this little sign on it that said, you know, thank you for all you do. And, you know, I mean, back when COVID first started, people were banging pots and pans and screaming and it's, but it was, it just struck me because, um, the, in that moment, I was like, oh, this is so sweet. Like, she's genuinely just very thankful. And, you know, and, but then um, I, re I realized, oh my gosh, this has like been a year of just, of endurance, right? In terms of like, because I go and I see patients every week um, and they thank you, but it's a little bit different, I think, because it's, they just, and it's just like this woman was just like, thank you for everything. She's just, and it just, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so I think that's when it actually hit me that like, wow, this really has been a year. Um, and it's been a year for our community um, and for so many different kind of cohorts within the community. And so my big thing is, you know, both for myself and then for my friends and colleagues is like you were saying, JT, is that um, I think mental health and recognizing that you don't have to be there's not something wrong with you to kind of rely on mental health support i think um is more and more important especially here in the upper midwest where i think the concept of having a therapist and having you know a, like a mental health provider is kind of a little bit taboo versus you know i grew up on in the east coast and we always joke that you know especially in new york city it's like everyone has a hairstylist and a therapist <laughs> um but I, I think some of that here, it's like, yeah, it's just, it's helpful to have someone to just talk to that, you know, they're not going to, they're not necessarily there to fix things, but you just need a pop off valve. Otherwise, you know, things will just keep kind of boiling up. And I think another thing that, you know, when, because of the pace of things, you know, we're reeling from like, the Atlanta to um, the Derek Chauvin trial to Dante Wright, it's like the pace of things coming at you is just um, so uh, kind of overwhelming at times mm -hmm. that I think being able to kind of recognize, okay, is this the day that I have to just unplug and, you know, go for a walk or, you know, call a friend or um, versus I think some of the downside of the pandemic is because we are so kind of self-isolating, you know, we're connecting via social media, but then you're also bombarded with, you know, like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, you know, and so <laughs> you get, you can get sucked into that um, and start seeing, you know, all the kind of negativity um, that's associated with that. Um, so, yeah, I think just having, you know, kind of mental health and recognizing what, what, you know, is good for your own self care isn't necessarily the same for the next person. So like, I was joking with a friend because our institution had a self care seminar via zoom. And I said, you know what, for my, my or not sorry, wellness seminar. <laughs> and I was like, my wellness does not come from another two hours of zoom. <laughs> um, so I'm going to choose that two hour time and like, go for a nice long bike ride. <laughs> instead. So so thank you, thank you so much for um, for sh for sharing that because yeah, you know, it has been. I love that it's that quote. It's been quite a year. <laughs> it's been quite a year, right? Um, but you know, but I was I was thinking about you know as you were talking about um, self care and like the Zoom right, the Zoom aspect. And some of me, some some of me, well, I shouldn't say some of me. I guess all of me kind of does think about you know even that lens of how how we see and should treat mental health, right? And how we discuss mental health. But it just got me thinking about, again, how we, how our systems are designed to make it harder, right? For some communities, mm -hmm. um, some populations to even 
think of wellness and mental health together, right? Mm -hmm. And again, so this, so these identities, right? So how we, because I know when I was growing up again too, right? Mental health, you, we go to church or you don't tell anybody your problems, right? Mm -hmm. My parents are from, from the West Indies, right? From South America. Um, and so they're like, we don't tell anybody anything. But so, so my dad might use church, right? He might talk to his, his minister, right? And then other, other communities might address mental health differently. So it just got me thinking, right? How we identify and how we show up, whether it's religious, gender, um, je you know, sexual orientation, right? All those things really inform who we are as individuals, right? And then how systems really have to think about who they are, who, who the person is, right? It's not this monolith. It's not this, like, so how do we start to think about that? And it j just got me thinking, mental health just got me thinking about that and how we each, um, cause I used to think self-care was just white, was whiteness, right? That was like, right. oh, <laughs> only white people do self-care. Like I don't have time to do a bubble bath, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was just interesting. Just, you know, I just, it just got me thinking about that. Just the whole idea about how we identify and how, our systems right, are even set up to kind of give us an idea of what is the ideal way of taking care of yourself. And they don't even yeah. think about racism. Like, oh, that's a whole different thing. Which how to take care of. Well, and I think kind of the interconnection of that, you know, we've seen it within medicine, but I think also needs to apply, obviously, in all other, you know, kind of aspects. But, you know, do you see yourself in in that provider, in the in kind of the professional, right? So within medicine, do you see yourself within with your provider? And you know, there was that study that came out about the morbidity mortality of um, black neonates. You know, depending on kind of the the race of the provider, if it was a white or black, and kind of the disparities. And then I know that there's been discussions within the mental health profession um, that you know it's predominantly white kind of providers, right? And so if you're talking about kind of uh, generational racialized or yeah, racialized trauma, is that someone that who, you know, who's, a, if the therapist is white, are you going to feel like you're going to be able to connect or, you know, um, feel some validation from that provider versus, um, versus not? And so it actually, I don't know if you guys watch the TV show, This Is Us, but um, this last season, uh, one of the characters is African American and he's adopted into a white family. And they talk specifically about that, where he was seeing a, a therapist and he was like, look, there's nothing against you, but I don't feel like we have a connection because the things that I am really struggling with, I, I wouldn't expect you to get, you know, and, um, and I just need to have, you know, for my own kind of like, uh, self-care, mental health, like I need to be able to have that connection. So I always tell my families and, and patients that, um, and as best as possible that the kind of mental health or therapist or any kind of like health related relationship, you know, with, that involves trust, like it's kind of like dating, you know, you, you might not, you know, just because someone looks good on paper, they might not be that right fit. And it's okay to just say, okay, you know, this isn't really working. Let's see if we can find someone else. Um, and then for, because I work with um, children who are adopted in foster care, so there's higher rates of mental health issues. And so sometimes I'll tell the families, the parents or, or the kids themselves, depending on the age of the kids, like, think about what is your issue? Is it related to your race or ethnicity? Or is it related to your sexuality or gendered identity? And then if you can kind of identify that, then it helps us to figure out, okay, who do we start with in terms of, you know, additional support uh, in the therap therapist world? Because they may not, you know, unless there's some unicorn therapist that I don't know about, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily expect like every therapist to be completely well-versed on everything that someone might be going through, so... Yeah, and and then um, because the other thing I was thinking about, especially um, in API communities, um, um, going back to kind of what you're saying, Kamara, is not only the learned experience, but the or the the experience or the shared experience between a therapist as well as a patient, but then there's a lot of questions and issues about limited English proficiency that um, whether it's from the parent or um, or even from the child standpoint and really 
getting that access to a, um, to mental health and um, being able to have in order to break down those barriers. Um, and, and we know traditionally mental health has been a has been an area that has been very difficult or has been diff, or has been had some difficulty for um, API communities to, a, to access um, because of various different barriers such as language and what have you. Um, and I think that's something to, that we also have to recognize. Um, the, I think one of the good things about, especially for our younger generations, is, um, is that the um, the emphasis on mental health has really has has really grown from that standpoint. Um, and I think that's been I think that's been um, a, a huge um, huge godsend for a lot of our a lot of our API community. But I um, I do still think that there's um, uh, plenty of barriers associated with mental health. And then on top of that, we know that access to mental health also requires time. It's not a one and done type of deal. Working with a therapist is a, um, is, is something that, um, especially for those with um, lower socioeconomic status and, and, and transportation issues, um, is a huge barrier, especially if, if you don't live in a, in a transportation heavy city like Chicago or New York, it's very hard to actually access from that standpoint. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. Yeah, the one thing I think that may be a positive from the pandemic is talking to mental health colleagues is that I think that we've realized how much we are able to do telehealth um, and, you know, that there has been um, movement in terms of multi-state licensing for mental health providers. And, you know, it still doesn't necessarily address the issue, like you said, Jonathan, about kind of the economics of it, um, you know, in terms of reimbursement and um, affordability, but um, I know that uh, within our area, it's that one thing that I have seen that's been maybe a positive, and then also the the younger generations. It doesn't again necessarily cover everyone, but I think the younger generations they don't. I mean, they've spent so much of their life on a screen or on a device that it doesn't seem to have that same barrier that it might for others, and so. They're like, yeah, I'll, you know, talk to you on my phone while I'm driving to wherever or, you know, <laughs> or I'll, or I mean, I know some of the, I was talking to one of my patients and her mental health therapist, they just correspond via text. Um, and mm-hmm. so it's, they don't actually, you know, and, and they, she said we can have sessions via phone if need be like audio, but a lot of it is just kind of a, you know, text exchange. Um And so I think for, you know, and for her, it's like, it might be that she doesn't feel she can disclose things via text that maybe she can't disclose kind of um, out loud to some degree um, with, you know, and have some more comfort, which I think, you know, for others, we'd be like, oh, that seems kind of odd. But (laughs) but so I think that's one thing that like the technology, I think, is really um interesting to see how hopefully that will continue to evolve and um, and grow to support these different platforms. So just sort of an aside, but related to the conversation, like I've had experiences with um, some of my patients that there's a generational gap, right? You know, I had one patient who said, well, I don't think my mom's going to really understand that I need to go to therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so So that's an interesting piece to try to try to navigate, right. And talk with, um, you know, the, so the intergeneration discussion, like, you know, the young person, the, the, the adolescent is interested in therapy, but trying to convince maybe there's, or maybe it, maybe it's an un, because they haven't talked about it. It's not really, it's a, it's a fear. That's not, it's an unfounded fear. The parent, the parent was willing to, to talk about it. Right. And say, okay, we can go to therapy, but again, it's this understanding, like, again, not having this communication this talk about, um, or being open to, you know, knowing to have have these conversations, right? Because we, you know, we can have the race conversation, have to have the mental health check in, right? Emotional check in with our kids as well. But you know, they're they they can be tough conversations if you haven't grown up um, talking about it, right? And therapy is okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, I think this. I think you know. Um, you know, to the credit for a lot of parents and grandparents that there's a lot going on, right? That that our parents and grandparents are dealing with right now between the mental health on um, mental health issues and mental health crisis um the violence the the very overt sense of violence that is out there against asian americans um it's very stressful it's anxiety provoking and i think um i think i i think we we should definitely acknowledge that this is a territory that 
for many is uh, scary and uh, for some uncharted or um, is really come um, much more to the mainstream that I think um, many are still struggling um, trying to figure out what to do. Um, I have many of my family members, like my mother, um, my cousins, none of them will go into the city anymore because they're absolutely scared that they're going to they're going to get attacked. Mm -hmm. And I, it's and it's, it, you know, a lot of these can be unrational un or uh, irrational, irrational fears. But at the same time, um, the sense of randomness and the sense that any anybody can come to you and attack. There was a great New Yorker um, cover which showed that uh, uh, the depiction of the mother and her daughter at the subway, and that, with that sense of tension and fear. And you sense that. I mean, uh, I can I can uh, recount my mother um, for a long time. Um, didn't go to visit my mother, my father's grave, because she was afraid to go out without us there. Um, to actually take her there because she didn't she didn't want to go to a restaurant. She only went to the grocery store very quickly because there's that sense of fear. And um, and I think navi helping our helping our families, helping the parents of our of our patients really help navigate navigate this um, this sense of unease. I think is a huge role that we play as physicians or as pediatricians because um, it's it it's. And I, I, it's hard, but it's it's the entire role, the entire sense of how do you reassure, but at the same time caution, which is a which is I think is a very difficult balancing act that we that that we have to help our patients and our patients' family play. So before um, before we end, I've been um, so the last question I, I've been asking my guests is about reimagining systems and institutions, right? Um, specifically to talk, you know, in the improving health of Black families and, and children. But, you know, given this broader conversation about equity, um, racial as well as health equity, I wanted to to talk about why it's essential, right? How do, how would we redesign systems, right, so that all kids, Asian, Asian children, brown children, Black children, really feel um, that they can attain this health and well-being? So I just wanted to get each of your thoughts about you know, how would, what would, if you, if you could, if, if you could make, make change, right, what, what change would you want to make? So we can start with Kamara first. Um, gosh, it's such a big question. I think, I mean, um, I think the biggest thing, and I don't, I don't necessarily have kind of the concrete plan or steps yet to figure out, but if I could wave a magic wand, I think just um, reimagining what it is to be an American, you know, so that if you, if you say the word American to someone, what's the first thing that pops to mind in terms of like a visual image? Um, and so in a way, kind of getting rid of the, the hyphen, the need for the hyphen, like Asian American, African American, Latinx American, you know, that we're, the American is all encompassing. And to me, that seems like if we could get to that place, then all of our kids, can feel equal and not othered. Um, and I don't at this point quite know, but I think that to that point, Jackie, that if we go back to what is the, the root cause, like the, the media and the way that we're taught, everything is very binary of white versus black or, you know, white and black. And then, you know, even some discussions of like white versus Asian community or sorry black versus Asian community and you know but if you start if you actually look demographically you know and you take kind of all of these sub kind of demographic groups and we start to amalgamate you know that starts to become kind of the global majority of the country and so um just loving to see kind of an expansion of how, and I think a lot of this probably comes from how we educate about the history of this country, you know, like, and um, this, the real history of kind of how this country came to be, how structures and institutions came to be, and <clears throat> what kind of happened along the way, um, and then helps us to move away from that myth of kind of the American, you know, you know, what it is to be American, the American dream and the um, 
kind of and who gets to be part of that dream and who gets to be kind of excluded in a way yeah no I, um uh, i completely agree, <laughs> agree with everything you said kamara and you know um to piggyback upon that and um cuz when i think about how do you how do you how do you make this um how do we bring more equity to asian americans is one is that is that sense of that that no that we're all americans but more importantly that that you are that you know you're filipino and that there's 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 so there's always something amazing about being filipino about being indian about being um about being korean or chinese or or what have you and that um there's that we have to take away that sense that you have to assimilate in order to be american and i think that's what's so important and i know the um uh, many of the uh, uh the newer generations are really beginning to embrace that and to really want that culture and i think that's um i think we always talk about america being this melting pot right but a melting pot has many ingredients and that's what makes it amazing um and um, and it's not just and it doesn't come out with what well, one particular flavor there's so many different um people's that that are here and that are Americans. Um, but I think that's part of, um, I think that's part of where we need to start off with is that assimilation isn't our goal when it comes to being Americans. Um, and um, to get rid of the otherness, because when you, when people um, don't assimilate, they become the other. And that if, if we really focus on, I just want you to be a Filipino that lives in America, that's wonderful. And I think um, and that we all have this, um, that we all have our own stories and that our stories should be celebrated and that our stories should be shared. And, um, you know, um, while we always start off with, with our names as our, one of the first marker, we always say that that's the, you can't judge a book by its cover, just like you can't judge our names by our cover. And I think this is what happens to a lot of our our adoptees that that um, that are adopted by uh, by white families or black families that there's there that they're still amazing they're still amazing folks and that um that that that, that their story should be heard and the story should be told and so I, you know, I like to start off from that. I mean, there's a lot of small little systems issues I would love to change, right? You know, better translation services and all those type of things. But um, it's it's kind of like any um, really really um, great i uh, um, really great project is it has to come from a really great idea. And I think we start with that, um, we can achieve so much. Yeah, I, um, just to piggyback on what you were saying, JT, I I lived for a year in Korea, and one of the questions, the common questions that people always ask, you know, when they say I'm from America, they say, oh, what's your favorite American food? And I'm like, um, I, I don't even know what that is, you know, because like, I'm like, I really like sushi. And I really <laughs> like, uh, you know, pizza, but is that American? Or is that Italian? Or, you know? So I think, like, similarly, if we could I mean, I don't actually really know what American food is. And um, if we could think about people in that way, that, you know, there's so much um, strength and wealth and um, beauty in the diversity of this country. And if we could really, like, fully embrace that, um, I think that would be amazing. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We always talk about how toddlers and kids are really good at this. And something happens where we start making them other, where we start th talking about others, um, at some time around middle school and high school, um, and I and I, I wish and I know uh, part of this is how we teach and how we enculturate our kids in school, but um, we have to really think about how we talk about others um, or how we talk about otherness and versus Americans. Um, in schools, um, in the office, just in general, in the in the general lexicon, um, and everybody talks about that that it's it's that childhood innocence that that keeps people together from that standpoint. But I, the, there's nothing out there that says that it, you can't have that when you grow up, when you get older. I think many many younger generations, like I, I say, younger generations, like you know those in the twenties and thirties, they're looking for that. They're looking for this togetherness. Um, but for some reason, society keeps trying to pull them away from each other. Um, and I really wish we would, that we would just continue to work towards that. So are there any projects that, any projects or things that you're working on that you'd like to, like you'd 
want to share with our audience or how they could reach out to you or, you know, or follow you? Um, I am actually kind of a, a newbie when it comes to social media. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I unfortunately am not, um, I mean, I, I'm kind of just figuring out. I just did the um, American Academy of Pediatrics Advocacy Conference. Um, and so I took a, like, a seminar with Social Media 101. So I just joined Twitter, but that's, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm on Twitter. I'm at JT Dagupan, D A G U P A N. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Um, and um, feel free to follow me. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is focused on medical education and um, really thinking about how do we teach um, uh, medicine through an anti racist lens. Um, working, I do work in that area as well as working in LGBTQ work, as well as working with transitioning patients from pediatric to adult care. Um, and um, if anybody's interested in, in reaching out, um, I, I'd love to talk. This, um, these are areas that I'm very passionate about. Um, and uh, yeah, no. And then I, 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 I just don't remember my Instagram handle. <laughs> <laughs> so I can add it afterwards. I yeah. Can add, it, add it for people. I'll, I'll find yeah. it. I'll find it and I'll get, I'll get your, your new Twitter handle, Kamara. Yeah. Yep. And I'm, um, I'm at the University of Minnesota. I'm in the adoption medicine clinic. So um, if people want to reach out to me in areas of about adoption or foster care, um, I'm also trying to look at both of these from an anti-racist lens as well um, and um, trying to reimagine how we can make the foster care system a more um, kind of successful and uh, equitable system, which is a project within itself. So um, if yes. anyone has any ideas, just send them my way. <laughs> Also, this has been a this been a this has been a wonderful conversation. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It's been fun. Well, that's all for today's episode of What Is Black. Thanks for listening, and thank you to our guests, Dr. Kamara Gustafson and Dr. Jonathan Tolentino, for joining me today. They shared great information and ideas. Links to resources for this episode will be posted on our website at whatisblack.co. Music and editing by Manny Simone. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. And to stay up to date, sign up for our newsletter at whatisblack.co.